we have sets of readings that we read every Sunday. And so it's always fascinating to me when they overlap with outside events. Sometimes that's in a way that's very stressful for a preacher. Sometimes it's related to the news of the day, and it's like, ah, ah, I don't like the way these things lay on top of each other. And sometimes it's amazing to see the Holy Spirit at work in things that when you look at them in a rigid spreadsheet as to what the readings are for a given Sunday, and find that it's kind of a curious way in which the Spirit speaks to us. Particularly the first reading that we have today is unusual because we normally don't read this text. Every other set of three years, we read these different first readings, and we're a few weeks into this semi-continuous series. And we're hearing the story of King David before he was King David. So last Sunday, if you were here, we got the David Goliath story, right? The danger of slingshots and all of the hazards of those bring, and the profound faith that David had that he could overcome Goliath when everybody around him was saying, yeah, this is not going to work. And yet, it did work. And today now, we move forward a bit. God has told God's people that you don't need a king. You're fine with just me. And the Israelites said, but everybody else has a king. We want a king. It's going to be fabulous. Spoiler alert, it's not fabulous. <laughs> so Saul comes along, and it's just kind of ugly. It does not work out well. David is the hero in the wings for having defeated Goliath, but becomes very deeply connected to Saul's son, Jonathan. Now, as we look at the text today on Sunday, June 30, and mindful of folks heading to the Pride Parade in San Francisco today, we get this curious verse at the very end of the first reading, where David claims his love for Jonathan beyond the love of a woman. And it's like, hey, what is this about? Now, there are some scholars that have taken this text and one or two others and run uh, a long distance on it, which may not be supported so much by the text. But it's a curious passage to have on a day like this. It's curious in particular because that love is never mentioned in regards to David and any of the women that have come through his life. It's only reserved for John. But I think the indicator for us is not necessarily some big, profound, modern, western overlay of this, but rather how deep relationships that we have as human beings come in all kinds of different varieties. We can think all throughout our lives of people that we have been profoundly connected with in ways that supersede perhaps other relationships, and none of them necessarily having to be romantic in nature. David speaks to this kind of connection. Curiously, if there is an overlay to this text, Jonathan, in particular, was known as a great warrior, the son of the king. We have David who slew Goliath. In anything, there is this common relationship in arms in fashion. But it's a reminder today, words that we don't typically use for those kinds of relationships, David is unafraid to use in the text. Love that we share for one another. When we move to the gospel text, though, it feels as though there's yet another linkage to today. We hear a very common story, but it's a long story. Mark, not long-winded, shortest gospel, oldest gospel. Usually everything happens, even as you heard it in the text today, immediately. Everything happens immediately. In the text today, though, we have two elaborate stories. Jesus gets back out of the boat. He was just in a boat last week. Now he's out of the boat. He is approached by a leader of the synagogue, Jairus. 
Now, think about this. The leader of the synagogue, this is somebody with a certain amount of privilege, right? I should be at the front of the line. We don't have the sense that that's necessarily how he is approaching Jesus. As someone whose child has been in the hospital for serious issues on more than one occasion, you have never seen a more desperate set of people than parents with seriously ill children. Nothing stands in the way if there is a perception that help can be found. This man shows up, but you can imagine those around him. Jesus, this is Jairus. He's one of the leaders of the synagogue. You should help him. You can imagine how the culture and the community there would have facilitated Jairus getting in touch with Jesus when he came into town, right? You can picture the boat coming up and the town leaders being there and they've got a key to the city to hand over, right? And this kind of thing. And, oh, have we introduced Jairus? He's an important figure in this community. Jairus might have been that kind of person, but likely was a desperate father in that moment, right? So Jesus says, sure, I will come. And then we get this almost comical story that changes through the Gospels as we get Volume 2 and Volume 3 through Luke and Matthew. In Jesus' Gospel, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is the most human of the four Gospels. And Jesus senses that he's been touched by someone, but he has no idea who it is. And the Greek is a little stilted, I think. We miss a little bit of the humor. In that Jesus looks around and there's this crowd of people pressed in and says, Who touched me? And the disciples are like, Dude, there's a lot of people. It could have anybody, literally, it could have been. But here is someone that we hear described as a woman who had a hemorrhage of 12 years. But I want to say it a little differently. She's not Jairus. Jairus has access, whether he perceived himself as using it or not. He was somebody who was going to be at the front of the line. This woman? No. No. She was not going to be at the front of the line. The people around Jairus at the boat, what would they have been saying? Jesus, you need to meet Jairus. Jesus, Jairus has made such a difference in our community. You should help him and his daughter. What would the people around Jesus in the crowd have said about the woman? They would not have said those kinds of things. Don't bother the rabbi. It's not appropriate for you to be here with your illness. Don't touch him. All of those things would have been beyond the pale. But when we think on this day, the last Sunday in June, as we remember particularly the LGBTQ community, we think throughout history of all kinds of different people for whom the crowd said, no, step back, don't touch the rabbi, you don't belong here. I think it's a fascinating parallel set of stories here. One of the things that I think I want to just kind of stop and say before I go a little further is that I think when we talk about welcome and openness, there is almost no one on the planet that would say that they were not open or welcome. No one. We all have lists. Of people. They may not be the same list, but we all have lists of people where we would say, no, don't touch, you don't belong here. Not people like you. We all have lists. Now, as we move through the rest of this story, this woman is healed. And let's think about this. 
we have two desperate situations. We have Jairus with a 12-year-old daughter who is dying, and we have this woman, 12 years. She has exhausted all of her money. What must first-century medicine have looked like to treat these kinds of issues? This must have been a horrific, horrific illness and path for her. So people become desperate. I'm going to put myself in the place where I'm not supposed to be. I am going to reach out and touch him when I'm not allowed to touch him. Allowed. It's not simply an issue of being polite. She's not forbidden. She reaches out and probably touches the fringe of his prayer shawl. We can kind of picture that rabbinical prayer shawl that Jesus might have wrapped around him. Power goes out for him. Jesus doesn't know who it is. In the later Gospels, he's more Superman. Ah, you, woman. But not in Mark's Gospel. To her credit, she comes forward. Now, how would this part of the story, how, how should it go? Jesus would be horrified that she had touched him. The idea of issues with blood, perhaps making him ritually unclean, such that he would not be able to do his functions as a rabbi, there's all kinds of things that could have happened. And instead, Jesus responds with, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Wow. wow. What is that communicating to the disciples, to the crowd, to the neighbors around? When does our dwelling to whomever it might be, communicate to those around us. There is a, a power in what happens in that moment. Then the story shifts, right? We have the, the messenger trots up to Jairus to give an update. There's no need to bother the rabbi anymore. Your daughter is dead. Feel the heaviness of it. Jesus says, have faith, have faith. And he goes to the house. She's not dead. She's just sleeping. You notice in the text, they laugh at him, right? Now, what's supposed to happen at this point? There are things that are not supposed to happen. As a religious leader, anything that has to do with blood, don't go anywhere near. See the story of the woman that we were just talking about. Another don't do, touching someone who has died. What does Jesus do? He walks straight in, lifts her up. There is a, a power. As Christians, we can't help but think of the Word of God made flesh at the beginning of Genesis. How does God create? Does God go to Home Depot, buy a bunch, a bunch of stuff, and make things? No. It's in the Word being passed out. Let there be light. And there was light. Talitha, the little girl, get up. She got up. The Word of God speaks. I think that these stories should jar us in a fashion. The social norms that would have moved Jairus to the front of the line and this woman to the back of the line, if not outside the building, Christ is striking down, stretching across, touching, bringing to life and wholeness returning to community everywhere. The ones that the religious leaders thought were important, the ones the religious leaders thought were unimportant. Everyone 
this game right now. So if I can leave you with two things on this Sunday, June 30, looking at these texts, is twofold. One is that it is important for us to remember that in our brokenness as human beings, we all have lists of people that we think have fallen short of the presence of Christ. We all do. And secondly, this text challenges us to open our hearts the way Jesus did, in a way 